the Department of Defense was focused on how are we going to do the dirty work of the Republic in space. Welcome back. I'm here again with David Morehouse. Hey, Sean. All right. So, so today we're going to discuss alternative theories about some of the things you see in the sky. And that's not to discount that there may still be plenty of things we can't explain, just that some of the things that we can't explain may be related to advanced technology, black projects, etc. And this is just an attempt to at least increase discernment of those sort of things that we might see in the sky that look like something that they're not. So, Dave, welcome again, my friend. Hey, Sean. Hey, thanks. You know, I'm always honored to be here with you and your remarkably intelligent and highly curious audience. And I gosh, I've, I've been with you almost from the beginning, right? And yeah, I, and I hope to grow with you too. I mean, you've been yeah. on two episodes since you were on Beyond Skinwalker Ranch and then The Unexplained, right? When's that going to air? They're still editing it. I actually owe them some more notes and things, but yeah, they're still editing it. So I, I don't know. It'll probably be a few months. Okay. So now. this is The Unexplained with William Shatner. Right. And it's an episode actually based on that. No, but we're oh, not supposed can't to talk say. about that. Yeah. We're not supposed to say what it is because not until it airs, because it's, I guess there's competition in the industry where if they're like, they're going to do a story about that, you know, then, you know, somebody else will break out the archives and do their own just so they can beat them to air date and take some of the wind out of their sails. So, yeah, no, but it, it, it's going to yeah, be Thanks fine. for stopping me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah, want to yeah. be the guy to <laughs> screw that up. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Always feel <laughs> compelled to stop me from like opening my, my fat mouth. I don't even look, I might not even know what it's about. Right. Who yeah, knows? Well, I, yeah, they they are pretty serious about having you sign you know, all these non-disclosure yeah. gag agreements that say you're not going to do that. And I don't, I understand, I, I get it. But afterwards, after it airs, then we can talk about we can talk about anything. You know, whether whether it was funny or silly or ridiculous or whatever the case may be. Television productions are completely different nowadays than they used to be. I mean, twenty years ago, when I was doing them or even 18 years ago when I was doing eight, maybe 15 years ago when I was doing them, they'd bring you and your assistant and they'd fly you and put you up in different hotel rooms and cover your per diem and everything else and pick you up, bring you there. I mean, there were times I'd have 10 remote viewers flown in from all over the country and do one of these show us what you can do things. And, you know, nowadays it's like, okay, yeah, we're going to put you in the back of the plane. <laughs> We're gonna put you in the back of the plane. You can Uber from there to this hotel. Do they yeah. still pay? They still reimburse you for it though? They do. They do. But after 12 spine surgeries, and there's no way I'm going into the cheap seats. I don't ask for business class or first class. I'm not a prima donna. But what I will do is I expect to go into whatever that in between class from those are, which is business economy or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, business economy, something like that. Where I at least have, I can stretch out and it goes back and I'm not four to a row, I'm three to a row kind of thing. And because of that, and they have a tendency to quibble now over that, like, well, you know, and I, I just get to the point where it's not worth it to me to argue yeah. over a few hundred bucks to go. It's not that important to me. So I'm not saying that they all do that, but they all kind of have a tendency to do that now. So I'm kind of like, you don't have to pay me anything. Well, uh, and then I'm, you're going to be on the concrete. <clears throat> podcast too right with danny yeah <laughs> i don't even know really what that's i haven't looked at their stuff but yeah that'll be in the next month but anyway right. okay uh, yeah anyway to what we're back saying, to the topic. i i gotta finish blowing smoke for you you know i was like i i just wanted to say i'm always really proud to be here and i'm really proud of you i'm proud to be here and i'm really proud of you and where you've taken this show because it's interesting to see somebody kind of step forward and always run the gauntlet of being a purveyor of truth right? as much as truth as possible in the world today. And I really, truly mean it. You know, it's kind of refreshing to see someone intelligent enough to be well-versed <laughs> in a wide variety of the topics that you cover here. Right. And, yeah. And but we're, I mean, are... but everybody gets fooled, right? <clears throat> At some point, everybody's going to get yeah. fooled and you just have to be 
cognizant of that. You have to be humble enough to admit, yep, they they got me on that one. <laughs> yeah, but you're a skilled interviewer, and I think that's amazing because you weren't trained to be an interviewer unless they did that uh, to you while you were learning to be an intel officer. For the, no, you know, I never, no army. training. No <clears throat> training wow. as an intel officer. I, they just, I was branch detailed the whole time, so yeah. they... I got a top secret clearance, but I never used it. And I had to get it at the very end of my time. So, yeah, but certainly you're doing a great job and your audience is getting uncensored exposure to different ideas and knowledge bases. And that's a good thing. And as a guy like me, who's, you know, interviewed frequently, I just want you and your audience to know it. it's really wonderful to be asked back again uh, to dialogue with you guys. I, I really enjoy it. So thank you. Well, you're like a key person in terms of growing the channel and stuff like that because you're an exceptional guest, as you know, right? Pe people who watch the show. Okay, everybody, we're but we're both uh, we're <laughs> actually dating. <laughs> uh, nothing no, wrong not with true. that, but nothing, yeah. nothing wrong with that. But no, that's not us. But we have a mutual respect because we're brothers in arms, meaning arms like weapons, Department of Defense kind of stuff. Anywho. In my purpose today is to present, as you said, an alternative perspective. And I'm going to do that by way of just information that the audience may or may not know from a historical perspective. It's tough. You don't get these kinds of perspectives in university or in, in any of your education these days. And it, it takes decades of having watched things evolved and decades of knowing where to look and what to see and etc. And I just have a different perspective, having grown up so many decades before all of you, the vast majority of you anyway. So as a CIA, DIA remote viewer and, and an educator of remote viewers, and as a program manager of remote viewers for various television broadcast tests of remote viewing capabilities for both law enforcement investigations, medical diagnostics, scientific investigations, you've all heard me say, over and over again, that due to my experiences in the field of remote viewing and as a on the ground investigator for remote viewing unit in various places, some in New Mexico and other places, that I know scientifically, logically, intellectually, mathematically, via common sense, that we are not the only intelligent life in our galaxy and certainly in the visible and non visible universe. And that statement, that doesn't even address the concept of other dimensional life or civilizations, uh, and, and planets, visitations, etc., outside of the visible or, or the known universe. But with this caveat, as a scientist and as a former special operations army officer, I'm compelled to say that my only real evidence is that of my personal experience that I express anecdotally and not empirically. And I'm always very clear with people about that. that. I have no empirical evidence of that existence. I've not touched an alien craft. I've not touched alien remains. I've seen non-human life and I have seen non-human craft and civilizations. I've seen them as a remote viewer, but I cannot express that in any way other than anecdotally. Even though I have a basis of knowledge that I'm going to talk to you about here in a minute. But unlike some, if somebody says to me that they have seen such things or they have touched such things, I'm going to tell you who told me that. So you've heard me mention his name before. It's Ron Blackburn. He was a PhD mm -hmm. uh, physicist who worked at Lawrence Livermore Air Force Base in California. And multiple times, Ron has told me that in his laboratory, his laboratory, not a laboratory, his, that he had several sets of non-human remains, that he'd seen them, that he'd touched them, and that he had worked with them, meaning researched with them. He told me that they were not alive. He told me that they were removed from crash, but that they were in his possession in his lab with other researchers who were looking at these life forms. Now, I have absolutely no reason to distrust him. I have absolutely no reason to dismiss him. When he told me that, which he did it on several occasions, he told me with complete and total honesty, he's not a loon. He wasn't flaky. He was very much 
in control of his faculties. He was an extremely intelligent physicist, and he was one of my remote viewing students and went all the way through all of the training with me, which at the time was like six different levels that we were teaching. So I would take that information to the bank because he's a man who didn't say, you can't use my name. And he was still serving at Lawrence Livermore at that time. He may be, or he may have passed away. I've not been in contact with him now for many years. So he was getting up there in years at that time, but still an amazing human being. I have another friend, a retired U.S. Air Force Colonel, Doug Hodge, one of my best friends in the last 25 years. He worked at the Nevada Test and Training Range, also known as Area 51. He worked there for six years, and he was uh, a PA. He's actually the Paragon Award winner, which makes him the number one PA in the Department of Defense. You mean uh, physician's I, assistant? For <clears throat> yeah, physician assistant. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. So as a PA physician assistant, he flew out on the aircraft from Las Vegas that had all the windows blacked out, landed, and had to wear foggles like everybody else to get to his particular place, duty station. But then when they were called out for anything of a medical emergency, a heart attack, a stroke, an injury, serious injury, anything that somebody couldn't be brought to the clinic. Then he rode in the ambulance because he was the number one medical authority there, other than, you know, flight surgeons and others that were at different places. But he would go out to those. And he said there was not a section or facility over those six years that he was aware of that he had not been to. And he did not have to wear foggles. When the ambulance goes out, they're not wearing foggles. They're driving and navigating to get to the place that they need to be to save human life. And they're all under, of course, their security clearances and their oaths, and they understand the consequences of exposing things. He told me that in six years, he never, ever saw anything remotely associated to an alien life form. He also said that he didn't see anything that looked to him like it might be an alien craft. He did say, though, I saw countless examples of very exotic craft that were clearly experimental craft, and they were not the kind of craft that you normally think of, look at, or consider, even beyond something like the SR-71, something like that. Even beyond that, these were craft that he would, of course, never know in his position as an Air Force officer, as a medical provider, he would not know that. But he said they were clearly not things that you see in the normal inventory. They were not things that you see perhaps showing up on Popular Mechanic or Aviation Weekly or anything else or Jane's or DOD News or any of those things. These were highly classified black budget projects that were servicing something. They were being developed for some reason. And, and that's where I'm kind of leading to this, right? But he never saw alien life form there and he never saw an alien craft there. It doesn't mean that there aren't any there and it doesn't mean either of those categories. It just means that this is a guy that I trust implicitly by name who was there for six years and wasn't just in one place for six years, was everywhere around there for six years. And I just told you exactly what he shared with me. And I know this guy well enough as a close friend of his, that if he had seen anything that I was barking up to or, or asking around about, he would have turned around to me and looked this way and that way and gone, yeah, I saw four of them. You know, that's what he would have done. He would have said yes. And if he had done that, I'd still be telling you this in this way. because I, I just would, because now he's no longer a member of the Air Force. And he was still in the Air Force when he told me these things. So I trust those two men. And I'm not going to stand up and tell the world that I know that we have non-human life form biological material and that we have alien craft from crashes that were reverse engineering. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say to you that 
these two individuals have told me what they saw based on their experience. And I can tell you what I've seen based on my experience as a DIA CIA remote viewer and what I've seen my students do. You yeah. said he was there for six years. What six years were they? Or what was the start and end date roughly? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know that. The reason I'm asking is I'm trying to triangulate with quote unquote whistleblowers. You know, who knows if they're whistleblowers or disinformation agents, but there's the whole yeah, Bob Lazar point. story, right? <laughs> so, and John Lear. And so the, what I'm trying to assess is whether or not your friend Doug and like mm -hmm. Lazar and Lear if their time overlapped, at least Lazar. Well, we worked together, Doug and I did, he was a Lieutenant Colonel. We worked together when I was the tester of record for the Defense Medical Material Program Office. And then after that, he was Lieutenant Colonel, then he was promoted to Colonel and went up to Columbus, Ohio, to the Air Force Base there, which is where the classified museum was, et cetera. He was a deputy of a- Wright Patterson? It is, right, Patterson, okay. yeah. And he was there as a full colonel and actually retired out of that position to go become the director of the National Center for Medical Readiness. And then I went there to be with him as the director of test and evaluation for medical device and medical procedures. So that would have been lieutenant colonel at 2006, 7, 8, 9, promoted to Colonel 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14. So this would have happened in the late 90s. After the Bob Lazar. So again, I'm not saying this is the truth or what happened. Yeah. There's always a chance that after the existence of Area 51 and, and what was allegedly going on got out with Bob Lazar, there's a chance they could have moved it covered it up and he didn't see it or there's just a chance that bob lazar is completely full of crap right I, yeah you have to always consider it all and i don't think it is safe to take some confession or pronouncement by any one person as absolute right. truth it just has not ever proven out to be in any way statistically speaking if you just want to look at it that way it, it's the wrong thing to do to take that one confession right or one statement of how it is and to accept that as an absolute uh, when that's being spoken personal anecdotes versus empiricism empiricism <clears throat> is going to be superior right the yeah, more data yeah. points you have and the more yeah you know. all right anyway didn't mean to steal your thunder brother no no not at all no i mean it's good that the point is reinforced we don't want to engage in absolutism any more than we want to engage in scientism all those kinds of things it, when you are listening to a story coming from a human being that's trying to present something as an absolute to you and is incapable for whatever reason of making sure that you understand that this is just my version of what I saw. But no, if they're standing up and beating your hand on the table and saying, you have to believe what I'm saying, this is real. This is what, I mean, it may be real to them, but human interpretation is one of the reasons why human intelligence is considered one of the least trustable forms of intelligence, right? It's the least trustable human right. intelligence. And yet we went to war in Iraq based on human intelligence. So anyway, as a remote viewer, there is my knowledge and my personal experience with historical correlation of remote viewing data pertaining to these civilizations that are not of this earth, non-human life forms of their technologies, of their intentions expressed as either indifference to us as a species or their intentions that are expressed as their inherent interests in us as a species, maybe for research purposes. There is experience that I have watched from my own experiences and that of my remote viewing students that show that these life forms can be benevolent, they can be malevolent, and everything in between. And this perspective is derived through the compilation of data of dozens of CIA, DIA remote viewers and all of their historical files. If and when they ever worked it, I, I can tell you that some of those viewers never worked those kinds of targets. Why? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe they just said they didn't want to do them. Others worked them and they did it in the blind 
And sometimes the projects were done in a double blind scenario. So the person who was training you, or maybe a monitor, or maybe even the program manager were not aware of the nature of the targets, but the target data was sent back to whoever requested it. And from the historical files that I had privy to and spent a great deal of time during the three years I was there looking at those. In fact, there's not a file I didn't look at. So in that place, you had a lot of time on your hands and I took good use of that. But anyway, having looked at the compilation of data of all of these target folders that dealt with non-human civilizations, non-human worlds, non-human craft. If you question that process, it read the titles of some of these books, seeing the mind of my enemy kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it was coming up with the personalities, the intentions, as I said, benevolent or malevolent. These are things that were being looked at and being recorded and being analyzed and being sent. So I want to let everybody know, again, it's not empirical data, it's data captured that you can now look at the correlation of that data over time. And you can say of dozens of remote viewers who have worked CIA, DIA remote viewers, you can look at this data and say, there's a statistical relevance here that over this time at the same target, this type of correlating trending data would manifest. And then there is the 30 plus years and thousands of off-planet target sessions conducted by my 26,000 plus remote viewing students over the year, as well as the thousands of open search outward remote viewing sessions conducted by those same 26,000 plus students around the globe that I trained. It is just an overwhelming amount of correlation of data when in the blind they're asked to look at something based on a set of coordinates that were first looked at in maybe 1979, right? Or 1981, or my time that I was there in the mid 80s when I was looking at this, but there were already dozens. I mean, these files were this thick, you know, some of them, which that's a lot of sessions that were done. So there was a lot of repetition. A lot of viewers were used and reused and reused and reused on them. And then some of them, you know, new ones would come in and they'd put that in there. It'd all be added into the same target folder, all these different viewers looking at this stuff. So in all of these experiences, right, hundreds of thousands, if God, not millions of data points, they compel me to accept the interpretation of that data to mean, and I mean this, we are not alone. We have never been alone. We will never be alone, but absolutely we are on our own. Okay. It's up to us. So I just wanted to remind the audience of what I believe because I'm going to make visible another perspective on things. I want to do kind of a historical perspective that lends an explanation to many, not all of you, of the UAP and the UFO phenomena, sightings, et cetera, non human life forms, et cetera. And I know that a lot of people don't know some of these things that I'm going to talk about. And I'm just, hoping you can somehow embrace some aspects of what I'm going to talk about here, because I know it will lend credibility and perspective and knowledge to everybody's individual or collective push toward full disclosure. And why am I doing it? Because not everything we see is what we think it is. And it's definitely not what we wish it might be. Some of it is, but not all of it. And it's important to know how much of the story we can grasp and hold and analyze as much of the story as history will allow us. And that's what and, we want to do here. And what you're effectively doing, at least helping the audience do, is to help combat confirmation bias, right? So Precisely. all of us want to believe, but in order for this disclosure process to be orderly, one thing that folks who are against disclosure are going to do is they're going to throw some of this stuff out at you in a way that is very compelling, that makes it look like a non-human intelligence. And then when you fall for it, hook, line, and sinker, they use it to discredit you. Oh, see, he's just a nut. It's obviously this secret program, things like that. So just think of this as a way to increase your informational Rolodex where 
if you see something in the sky, you'll be able to cross-reference some of these things so that you can eliminate every possible explanation before you get to the one that is unexplained. So again, David's not on here to tell you that this is not real, that these are all government projects. He's on here to show you what some of these government projects might look like so that you're forewarned and forearmed in the event that you see something in the sky. You can be much more intelligent about it and how you approach it and how you eliminate things. And this is one of those things, and I've talked about this a little bit on my live session and in the past, is we just had the Perseid meteor showers. I saw something streak across the sky. It's like something in a blue arc. And I didn't know what it was, but the first thing I tried to do was eliminate what the possibilities are. And the first possibility I thought it could be is potentially it was a meteorite. And it turned out it was the night before the most active night of the Perseid showers in August. So it'll help you not look like a fool when you come out and just say, I don't know what it is, but it's aliens. Yeah. Thank you. And that happens a lot because people will see something and say there's no obvious means of propulsion or there are no flight control surfaces on it. And it doesn't look like anything that's in the inventory. And it doesn't. It'll come from seemingly credible sources. And there's a reason why those credible sources don't have a basis for understanding what it is. There's a reason. And we're going to get into that when we start the second segment. But where I want to take you right now is back to the beginning. And I want to talk about the origin of the space wars, because that has existed for a long time, longer than most of you can possibly imagine, unless you've been tied into these kinds of things, or you are interested in this kind of historical perspective. But back in the beginning, before even unmanned space flight happened, these things happened. The power nations, which at the time were the Soviet Union and the United States, China was still a struggling, fighting and starving under Mao at this particular time. But the United States and the USSR were to the world the dominant economic and military powers. And both of them recognized the following. Whomever gets there first into space with the most has the advantage to watch the world and their enemies with extraordinary data granularity. And it also would then possess the ability to rain hell and fire down over any potential adversary. Now, we're going to talk about while there was public speak about defensive or exploratory things in nature, the background and the efforts were always offensive. In truth, you can't have one without the other. That dynamic doesn't exist in nature nor in the human animal, right? So in December, of 1945, December 1945, the end of World War II, the chief of staff of the army, an army officer by the name of General Four Star, okay, Henry Arnold, teamed up with a PhD, Dr. Theodore von Kamen, and they put into motion, December of 45, a 50 year vision of strategic intelligence operations in space. They established the United States Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, which was designed, they recognized that this guy, this general, Arnold, found a friend in this PhD, Von Kamen, and they understood that they needed to marry scientists with U.S. Air Force Department of Defense personnel, and they needed to figure out a way to push nuclear weaponry, nuclear capability. They were discussing at that very time missiles and other things. And remember, we're still flying around in piston-driven aircraft at that point. Our bombers and fighters were piston-driven. And they know what the Nazis did. <laughs> they saw jet engines on, on fighter aircraft, and they saw the V-2 rockets. They knew, which is why there was such a huge push to pull in 
even if they were affiliated with the Nazi party to pull in scientists, both Russia and the United States, because both understood that the nature of war was not going to change, but the way in which war is fought was going to change and where war was going to be fought was going to change. And that thought process for both countries, the USSR and the United States, began in 1945, immediately following the war and a revelation of weapons advancements and other things that the Nazis had been involved in. So these two guys established this U.S. Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. It wasn't the U.S. Air Force then. It was the Army Air Corps, later became the U.S. Air Force. And they also established something called Project RAND which involved the RAND Corporation. They bring in the RAND Corporation, which is kind of a research think tank capability that was there. And Project RAND was to start looking at what it is that we can do to carry as quickly as we could from a Department of Defense perspective, war into this new dimension of space. Just think of that in 1945, still flying around piston airplanes, how strategically futuristic that thought process might have been. So this is 45. On 4th of October, 1957, at 1928 and 38 seconds, UTC, something called 8 Kilo 7 1 Papa Sierra, also known to us as Sputnik, was launched into orbit. And now the Cold War moved into space, and the space wars began. Everything up to that point in time was strategic and theoretical and research-oriented, but when that happened, this Cold War moved into space, and the space wars began. Now, it's funny when you look back and think about those things, because especially we'll talk about how President Kennedy couched this, because at that point, space war fell into two different tracks, both for specific purposes and one to cover the other. So, okay. So, 10 months after Sputnik goes up, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signs something called the National Aeronautics and Space Act. He did that on 29 July 1958, 10 months after Sputnik. And he thereby established the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. No mention was made of anything going on within the DOD for good damn reason, right? For good reason. So this whole NASA, the Space Administration, was the United States discovery and exploration endeavor. And that's how you heard it. Nobody was talking about space war. Nobody was talking about the development of weapons or anything else in that respect. They were talking about this is for discovery for all mankind, right? One step for man, et cetera, right? One giant leap for mankind. Everything coming out of NASA was all focused around the discovery and the exploratory endeavor of the United States. It was not a space war, it was a space race. That's how. It was presented to us. This is a race. It's a competition amongst nations. And we are all going to further technology and we are going to further our understanding of the edge of the frontier. But at the very same time that that was signed in 58, we were hard at work within the U.S. Air Force and elements of the U.S. Army and other places within the DOD and members of the military industrial complex, right? contractors, all of these new agencies forming, recognizing what was going to happening. But what the Department of Defense was focused on, while NASA was focused on discovery and exploration, the Department of Defense was focused on how are we going to do the dirty work of the Republic in space? How are we going to prosecute the space war? The Soviet Union wasn't fooled by any of that, right? They weren't fooled by it at all. They were right on board with doing exactly the same thing, only they weren't couching it as discovery and exploration. They were just back doing it as, this is what we have to do. We're going to get up there before you. So because the NASA space program and the DOD program was in the estimation of the leadership, 
chairman of the Joint Chiefs, et cetera, and the President of the United States, Secretary of Defense, et cetera, that it was lagging behind. And espionage indicators showed that the Soviet Union was now, in addition to having Sputnik, that they were well on their way to putting a man in orbit around the planet to have the first man in space. And in fact, did beat us with that. They had already put dogs up and other things. Their rocket science was proving to be better than ours, but that's just kind of what we thought. We don't really know because they were pushing the envelope and they were pushing the envelope in the way that the Soviet Union did, which said, you either accomplish what we're asking you to accomplish or we'll execute you. <laughs> Good thing, right? So in 25 May 1961, just under three years later, John F. Kennedy, our president, stands before Congress and he's delivering a message. And the message is titled on all the documents for Congress, urgent national needs. Now think about that. If we were just talking about discovery and exploration, why would you title the documentation urgent national needs, right? And what he does in this session with Congress is he asks them for seven to nine billion dollars in additional funds. And at that point, he is saying that he is going to be setting a goal. What becomes public is that he is setting the goal for the United States to put a man on the moon before 1970. Okay. This is 1961. So again, you're hearing urgent national needs, which is referring to the need to fund the effort in the war, the space war. It is not a request for more money to continue the race for space or the race for the moon. Both get a certain portion of that money, but the money that is funneled off of that $9 billion budget, which was what was given eventually, a portion goes to NASA, but a big portion of it goes into the Department of Defense to continue to develop the experimentation, the research, the testing, of so many different things within the Department of Defense's race towards supporting the space war, the new dimension of war, space. So when that happened, it pushed money and our exploration and discovery cover and effort was designed not to just make people look the other way, but it was also done to cause the Soviet Union to have to see what was happening there and whether they wanted to or didn't want to they were going to have to try to address what we were doing technologically and how the world was starting to see the united states so now it became a war of not only who gets the space and controls that space but it was also a race of ideologies expressing power and i always love you know mikhail gorbachev just before the Soviet Union falls, while he's in the midst of the Chernobyl crisis, says, our power comes from the perception of our power. Okay. In other words, we cannot let capitalists win this race, even though we aren't really in a race for the moon. We're in a race for domination of space, not a race to get to the moon, a race for domination of space, militaristically, strategically. That's what we're in a race for. But in the summer, July of 1969, Apollo 11 lands on the moon. And Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin Jr. land on the moon, making JFK's vision a reality of our discovery and exploration. But the other piece was accomplished. The Russians saw it as a failure. It forced them to expend more resources, take bigger and bigger risks struggle to catch up and in so doing they killed many of their astronauts in poorly designed and flawed spacecraft and many of their scientists and engineers who had caused this failure in the eyes of the leadership were imprisoned or demoted or simply fired or executed all of the above as it turns out was true so 
Let's go backwards now for a minute because I want to talk to you about what happened while everybody was looking at NASA and, and NASA was on the front page and uh, all the guys in the right stuff were on the front page and all those other things, all the other things that were happening at, in the Department of Defense level. People just didn't connect the dots. People thought, oh, well, we're just trying to go Mach 1 because when we go Mach 1, well, we can build aircraft that will go Mach 1. Well, just listen to what I'm going to say to you. On 24 January in 1958, seven months before President Eisenhower established NASA, the United States Air Force Astronautics Development Program was submitted to the Defense Department, articulating five major systems that the Air Force wanted to pursue in space. Seven months before Eisenhower established NASA. They wanted to, and had already started doing in 1956, April of, ballistic testing and development of related systems to be used in space, weapons. They were outlining the manned hypersonic research program to include unmanned and manned vehicles. They were going to develop the X-15, which they did, the North American X-15 which in 1959 went 4,500 miles per hour, Mach 6.7, in 1959, before we ever got on the moon. They were developing the Boeing X-20 Dinosaur Orbital Glider. Now, this is X-20 Dinosaur Orbital Glider. It looks unlike any plane you'd ever seen. It looks sexier than, than the space shuttle look. And they wanted this glider, this orbital glider to be built in three different configurations. They wanted a bomber version of it. Of course, right? A bomber version. They wanted an interceptor version. Interceptor means it's a fighter interceptor. It means it's going to go to kill things. It's going to go kill satellites, or it's going to kill rockets, or it's going to kill something else. That's what an interceptor does. It usually refers to interceptor fighters. Those fighters come off the ground quickly and they go to interdict, to intercept and destroy incoming missiles or incoming aircraft or incoming bombers, those kinds of things. The third variant of this Boeing X-20 was going to be a reconnaissance variant. They also provided the outline, the diagrams and the budget proposals and the research as to where they were for DOD for the Whiskey Sierra 117 Lima Advanced Reconnaissance System. Now, so unknown to most people, but the U.S. Air Force had astronauts that crewed four of them in this military strategic space station. This space station was in orbit with Air Force astronauts on board it. And most people have no idea that that was ever the intention. I have seen the spacesuits and the helmets and the whole get up that was all not NASA. It was U.S. Air Force. Is this stuff public information? <coughs> um, for if you look hard enough for it, yeah. I don't know where it would be public. I saw these uniforms at the classified Air Force Museum in Wright-Patterson. That's where I saw it. And that's where I came to know about this. And if you are writing down what I'm saying, then you can go look for this stuff and there will be references to it in different places. And if you start digging through the layers, you will eventually get probably something that's been declassified that was classified top secret in under some black budget project way back when. Uh, well, one these, thing that you mentioned, the, the X-20, so I quickly looked it up. One aspect of this space program or these space programs, one that was public, the other one was secret was at the end of 1945, there's also Operation Paperclip. So for instance, the X-20 was based on a German design from World War II. Yep. So again, I don't want to insert too much, but gathering the scientists, there was also that war for talent. It wasn't really a voluntary war for the Germans. It's basically whether or not the Russians could get to them first or we could get to them. So right. anyway, I just want to throw that out there as part of 
And most of the German scientists understood the conditions they would be working under had they been scooped up by Stalin and put to work there. It was either make every effort to get to the Americans and sell yourself to them, knowing that your talents were going to be wanted, and they were, or allow yourself to be scooped up and basically become slave labor for the Soviets. And so that's why we ended up getting the bigger load of that kind of scientific talent than the Russians did. I, I don't know if we got more of the documentation and the research and that kind of thing. I, I would suppose that the really critical stuff came with the scientists. I mean, I'm sure that that was proof of their worth to the United States in order to get there. And I know a lot of people have, particularly people given just the 11 million people that were destroyed in the genocide of the Nazis and the SS, you know, 6 million Jews and 5 million gypsies and other what they considered undesirable. So there was a whole other 5 million other people that were killed in that genocide as well. It's a total of 11 million human beings destroyed by that, not just six. So they needed to come with a bona fides and with an established value, or they could have some of them because of their affiliation with the Nazi party could have been lumped in. One of Von Braun, he was a guy that developed the V2 rocket, which rained down over the UK for years, right? So all of those things could be held to account for that as war crimes or maybe just over-the-top weapons development. I, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, that's a true part of the story, that that's where much of this came from. It's scary when you think about it, how far the Nazis were pushing these kinds of things. And it's also an indicator as to why when tyrants reign and they reign unchecked, that any kind of Pollyannish perspective over the idea that these things won't come to pass. So it's just like prime minister before Churchill, who was so naive to think that Herr Hitler only promised that he only wanted the Sudanland and he didn't want anything past that, right? I mean, Neville Chamberlain. Peace yeah, Neville time. Chamberlain. Yeah. Yes, thank you. It's another reason why when tyranny like that reigns, tyranny and murderous activity, and you have smart people putting together weapons that would literally have allowed the millennial Third Reich to be what Hitler wanted it to be, driven by a madman. It's why total war is what is required to stop that. Total war and nothing but that. You have to completely decimate that entire infrastructure, every dog, cat, chicken, cow, farm, factory, house, everything, man, woman, child, until they are bombed into submission. And interestingly, in the two instances where we have seen that in our long and sordid, murderous million year history, to quote something from Captain Kirk and Star Trek, which was not written by him, but you know, he said it, that once that has happened, that the two offending parties in that, that, you know, really came through the Second World War as the antagonists that started it all, they've not ever once again after that time ever attempted to rise back up into that seat of power. But prior to that happening, they had a very long history of invading and murdering and destroying Japanese and in China and Manchuria and the Germans World War I and then came right back again and started again a look at the devastation. So it's why my vote for total war, vice limited war that protracts over 20 years and then we just pack up and haul ass. Yeah. I mean, total war is when it gets to that point, that's what you're going to do to change things. That's what has to happen. And it did. So anyway, back to this story of where we were here. Sorry for that segue. So this space station that was going to be crewed by U.S. Air Force astronauts was being created and in fact was eventually. And then there was another program called the Lunex Project which was to put a strategic U.S. Air Force base on the moon. So a strategic U.S. Air Force base would have been put there for several reasons. To establish an own territory, it would have been defensible. It probably would have had a defensive or offensive weapons capability. I can't imagine that at that point, weapons being fired from the moon back to the Earth would have any effect whatsoever. 
but certainly if you're going to establish strategic air force base it only means that you're going to expand and own critical pieces of territory there whether to mine or whether to uh, just establish weapons platforms there and say we own this as a slingshot or as a jump off point to go to mars or to go somewhere else it was about ownership of it so these were the things that were going on within the Department of Defense from traveling at 4,500 miles per hour, Mach 6.7 in 1959, to building the X-20 bomber, the X-20 interceptor, and the X-20 reconnaissance variants, putting a manned strategic space station in orbit where you could then spy out on the real or perceived enemies of your nation, and establishing a strategic military foothold on the surface of the moon through the Lunex project. So I, I think, you know, Sean, you, this is probably a, kind of a natural break point for this segment. And when we come back, I'd like to carry us into the realm of the technological products of the space wars. And I'm going to talk about craft, craft that you probably have never heard about, or seen, or maybe you've seen and then thought they were something else. I'm going to talk about weapons that were developed for the space wars. I'm going to talk about propulsion and exotic propulsion, exotic materials, the strategies for the space wars, the competition brought about through the espionage efforts by companies that were now emerging over the decades, like China, eventually. The fact that China and Russia have signed a pact against the United States as two communist nation states. And I want to talk about special access programs and black projects in relation to the espionage and why it's so critical and why it is so critical that when you see something or hear something or somebody tells you something, that it is not forthcoming because we are in a war and we are in a war for our very lives. And if you doubt that, you can only look back over history because if you turn your head away from that, it'll repeat itself. You have tyrants in both those countries and you've got one who's already taken the Crimea and now is taking Ukraine and has made it very clear his intention is to reestablish the Soviet Union. Very clear. That's his intention to do that. So you can say, ah, Peshaw, I don't think so. Yeah. Watch and wait. Because it will. And I want to talk a little bit more when next we come back. I want to talk about some of this other stuff because I think it'll fascinate you. And I think you'll be amazed. It'll make you grin. It'll also make you cheer, you know, the fat, the things we've been doing since 1945. And it'll answer a lot of the questions. It won't answer all the questions. And it certainly everything you see zipping around up there uh, probably doesn't fit into these categories, but a lot of it does. And it's kind of cool to think of it that way, to know where we are and that we're kind of leading the way in some of this stuff, some of it, not all of it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, David. It was a absolute pleasure and see you on the next episode, brother. All right, brother. Thanks. Thanks everybody for listening. If you enjoyed this video, please click on like subscribe and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime I post something new. Oh, <laughs>